Hello, this will be uh, my review for Iron Man 3. Um, very late on this one. It's kind of that weird middle ground where it's, it is sort of a recent movie, so, but at the same time it's not like old enough to where people think, oh yeah, that. You know, it's, it's kind of this weird middle ground. But in any case, Iron Man 3, I was extremely disappointed by this movie. I'll tell you that right up front. Um, I've heard good things about it. I've heard bad things about it. Whatever. My main problem with this movie, I'll tell you right now, is not anything to do with Mandarin. If anything, the one thing this movie absolutely nails is the twist in it. If you haven't seen the movie yet, stop watching this shitty review of mine. Um, because I'm about to spoil it. Um, turns out... Last chance. Turns out, the Mandarin is an actor, right? And he's being, uh, he's, he's putting on a show so that he can distract Tony Stark and company from the real villain, who is this Aldridge Killian? Aldridge Killian, that's who it was. Um, and he's, Aldridge Killian as a villain, um, he's fine, nothing special. He could have been better if the execution was a little better, but they have this really weird setup with him as far as backstory is concerned. They kind of have him pitched as the scornful villain like he's out for payback because Robert Downey Jr.'s didn't um didn't go meet him on the roof this one time um but at the same time they also sell it as he's only even involving Tony because Tony threatened him on TV or threatened the Mandarin on TV or whatever um so they, they kind of pitch it both ways I feel like it's more it's it, the the truth lies closer to the, you know that he's only involving Robert Downey Jr. because of threatening him on t threatening the Mandarin on TV, um, but whatever it's it's not too big of an of a debate really it doesn't really matter too much either way because it's not really too well done like it's fine in, in, in its execution Aldrich Killian's character is not the problem with this movie the Mandarin was not the problem in this movie the movie's twist was actually extremely well done. It was a surprising twist for those of you who, for anyone who hadn't had it already spoiled to them. And when a movie can really throw you through a loop like that, that's always something to admire. Um, it gets, in fact, I'm giving it a whole bonus point off of just the twist. So if you didn't like the twist, um, well, sorry, I did. Now that said, I don't know if using the Mandarin for that twist is the best choice, or I should, I should say was the best choice. For those of you who do not know, the Mandarin is to Iron Man as Loki is to Thor. And considering how big a fucking deal Loki is, you know, they kind of toss the best chance of having a another great villain in the Marvel Universe. Because, honestly, the biggest problem with the Marvel Universe right now is that the only seriously interesting villain there is right now is Loki. They only have one interesting villain, and they have all these other superheroes running around. That it feels a little off balance. And they kind of lost the opportunity of ever using the Mandarin in the future in a way like look, they used Loki. And Loki, you know, the Mandarin is a really cool character in the comics. I can't claim to have read the comics at all myself, but I did some research. He's, he's definitely a very interesting character. He's, um, he's like a kung fu master who also has these alien power rings, ten of them. And you can kind of see the Mandarins wearing these ten rings in the movie, so... I mean, credit to them for at least keeping that much consistent. But, in any case... In the movie, though, they're not power rings, they're just rings. Um, and the Mandarin is so good at kung fu and stuff, and he's so good at, you know, um, realizing the self that he's able to fight Iron Man when Iron Man's in his suit, you know, and that's just kung fu and, you know, occasionally the rings. Um, and that's cool, you know, in and of itself, that's really fucking cool, just, just the realization of the self and it's also really unique in that the mandarin was the mysticism or the nature element of the uh equation and iron man was the technology and progress element and iron man's the good guy and mandarin's the bad guy usually it's the other way around and mysticism is playing the underdog and mysticism comes out on top in this case um it was like i said it, it, as far as protagonist and antagonist is concerned it was reversed and there wasn't an underdog, it was set up as an even match. Now, none of that really carries off into the this reason. It's Iron Man 3, which is something to note. Instead, 
they decide to pull a Rocky and just recast Robert Downey Jr. as the underdog. And it doesn't work very well at all because you have to remember in Iron Man 1, Tony built his first suit with scraps in a cave. He built an arc reactor with scraps in a cave. And at a point in this movie, he has to repair one of his suits. And he's shown, he, it's, the movie clearly demonstrates that he has access to a convenience store. He has access to a mechanic shop. He has access to all this shit. And instead, he just makes like these little gadgets and gizmos so that he can go in without his suit. It does not make much sense at all. It's kind of a running theme with this movie. Very little of it ends up making sense. They had things they wanted to do with it, you know, as far as the plot's concerned, and they just did it, and then they thought about how they could try to make it sense, make it make sense later, and then I guess maybe they put in like half of an effort, but it really wasn't enough, and it definitely shows in the movie. Um, yeah. For example, like I said, he has to repair his suit, and in the meantime, while it's being repaired, um, A, Jarvis is offline, and B, he is completely isolated. He has no other suits that he can use. Um, for those of you who have seen the trailer, you'd be like, well, he has a lot of other suits. Maybe he has to fix his house, too. Uh, he never touches his house after it's blown up, but for the final climactic bit of the movie, he just calls in all his other suits. I think it was like... Operation House Party or some command that he gave to Jarvis. And this um, launched every single other Iron Man suit he had, which would be 42 of them. Um, so 42 other Iron Man suits, all of them autonomously, autonomously piloted by Jarvis, um, are brought in as cavalry members. And uh, it's like, why didn't you do any of that earlier? That could have saved some trouble. There's another point in the movie where... Actually, at the very end of the movie, um, he blows up all of his Iron Man suits as a showing to his girlfriend Pepper Potts that, hey, I'm willing to just, I'm willing to put you as number one. It's like, oh, well, I'm great you're on that level with your girlfriend, but seeing as you're a member of the Avengers and S.H.I.E.L.D.'s a thing, you could have at least donated them to S.H.I.E.L.D. and kept Jarvis in them so S.H.I.E.L.D. could just be like, press a button and send them out in your stead and you could just hang out with Pepper Potts all the time. But no, you blew them all up, so now you're going to be need to be the one that's called in to help the Avengers, and there's only going to be one of you. So this is very counterproductive on every front. Doesn't make sense, but hey, it's a happy ending, and he's being nice to, you know, it's like, whatever. Um, yeah, another point in the movie. Um, the war machine suit that is piloted by Tony Stark's friend in the military. Um... First of all, it gets completely immobilized and almost like, yeah, immobilized. It gets like knocked out of commission when one of Aldridge Killian's um, henchmen uses their firepower where they just superheat their hands and just grabs it by the wrist and somehow that basically decommissions this fucker. It's like, how does that work exactly? Um, I understand shit's hot, maybe it's melting some metal, but the wrist is all he has touched, or she has touched. Um, why is the entire suit out? That makes no sense. Can I explain that? No, it never explains that. Um, the henchmen in this movie have this very weird grab bag of powers. The secondary villain in this movie being the chick that invents these power, this, this serum that gives these people these powers. She's very... Also, like the main villain, is very inconsistently written. Um... The suits also are very inconsistent. They show varying degrees of durability without much explanation as to why, although at the same time they are separate suits, um, each a unique design, so I guess that kind of helps out. But also you have to remember, Tony Stark's suit held up in a fight against Thor. The god of, or demigod I guess, he's not like a legitimate god. The demigod of thunder, right? And that was a scene that was done well because it was mysticism and technology put on equal footing and neither was the underdog and neither was really the good guy or the bad guy um boom that was it well done here no it's not well done also here um just random henchmen with fire powers are able to just trash these suits like what the fuck um how does that make any content uh, sense with the continuity also um this is the first iron man movie in which no agents of shield or nick fury or avenger of any kind 
are seen in the movie at all. None of them are ever seen. You see more of them in Iron Man 1 and 2. Iron Man 1, which is a very, by comparison, small deal to Aldrich Killian's deal where he's got, like, even if it's just a charade where Aldrich Killian has the world at, at ransom. We don't see a single member of S.H.I.E.L.D. Why does that, why does that happen? We never see... We don't even see um, uh, the Hulk in this movie, or or Bruce Banner. We don't see either of them. We, which makes very little sense to me, considering how buddy buddy they were in the Avengers. Um, the problem with this movie and a lot of these continuity errors is how it links up to other movies in the Marvel universe. It kind of wants to be its own Iron Man movie. It's kind of looking back at the first Iron Man and saying. This was the biggest hit. This was the one that put Marvel movies on the map. Let's just try to be that again with as little um, acknowledgement of the other movies as possible. And it's like, you can't do that by this point. By this point, things are too connected. You know? Especially considering that within the movie itself, it references the events in New York multiple times. Speaking of which, it references New York because apparently Tony has been traumatized by what happened in New York. Which makes very little sense to me, again, because Tony has been in worse life or death situations than that and pulled out not only with a, without a scar, but actually as an improved person. Remember, like I said, Iron Man 1. Um, he's locked up in a cave and forced to make weapons. Um, his life is at risk. He has this guy that's helping him out. Um, he eventually dies in this cave. Um, it was, it's, all, it's all very emotional. In The Avengers, though, he goes into space with a nuke and then he falls back home it, it was it's really it was just a risky flight more or less and somehow the latter of those two is what has traumatized Tony Stark like I said many times before in this review this movie has such horrible continuity with the other Marvel movies it is ridiculous and as somebody who's seen all the other Marvel movies it's extremely distracting when you're sitting there watching this and thinking, well, this wouldn't be a problem if it just made sense, you know? Uh, also, going back to the uh, War Machine suit, um, first off, when they get um, Tony Stark's friend, I can't remember his character's name, um, I think he's a colonel of some kind, um, in any case, uh, when they get him out of the suit because they need to use the suit for their own purposes, they don't kill him. They just lock him up, I think, or something. It's so dumb. Why don't they kill him? They, they're clearly not nice people, you know? Uh, at one point, the, one of uh, his henchmen's like, all right, we can do this the easy way or the fun way. And she's like, all right, the easy way. And the easy way to her is fucking taking her badge, or her fake badge, superheating it and pressing it in the dude's face, you know? The fun to her is violence and uh, mayhem, you know? And you know, these are not nice people. Why are they just keeping this dude alive in perfect shape? Um, then they use iron, the, the, the war machine suit as a disguise so one of their henchmen can get aboard Air Force One. Then they uh, take out everyone on the plane but the president. They put the president in the war machine suit. And then the war machine suit autonomously um, flies off to um, Killian and the, the rest of his gang so they can set up for their big plan um, involving the president. Uh, then later in the movie, they have apparently still not taken the president out of the suit. They're using the suit as a, a makeshift restrainment, uh, restraint for him, which I guess to a degree at this point so far makes sense. And uh, they also have the face slot open, so he's a little bit vulnerable. And they have him strung up over top of this giant oil tanker, and they're going to set the oil tanker on fire, and this is going to cook him alive. And it's going to be staged as a political statement. They're going to have the Mandarin do all the acting and stuff. Really has nothing to do with that. The Mandarin is their excuse. It's their distraction, like I said. Um, what they're actually doing here is they're killing off the president so that they can have the vice president, who is their man on the inside, take hold of the uh, presidency, and then they'll have the most powerful man in the world in their pocket, per se. Now, one would ask, why not just straight up kill the president? Well, because then it might be a little bit too obvious. They, Like I said, they're trying to use the Mandarin as a smokescreen, and... It's actually, it makes a bit of sense. But here's the issue. When Tony Stark's friend, the colonel, gets the president out of the war machine suit, um, 
he then just straight up gets in the war machine suit and flies the fuck off. Why is he now immediately back to being full functional? It doesn't make much sense at all. Now, I guess it makes a little more sense when you consider that Tony's suits can um, be set up to only work for certain people, but at the same time, the suit has been hacked to shit, and you see other people in the movie making use of the suit without any issue, so why couldn't the president just use the suit? As soon as the president got in the suit, why wasn't he just able to just be like, all right, now I'm in the suit, and then just do badass things. You can have a president in the war machine suit that's all painted up red, white, and blue. It'd be great. And hilarious um, but no that's not what happens it's just silly and doesn't make any sense and the continuity is trash um if this were a standalone movie it would be a lot better is I guess something I'm trying to get out here but it's not it Marvel movies need to acknowledge that they are Marvel movies in a Marvel universe with other movies with other continuities that they need to make sense with we're not trying to make... Th we, the last thing we need is for um, the Marvel Universe to become as much of a mess as the X-Men Universe was not so long ago. That would not be very nice. That would Now, at the end of the day, though, I can say at least that if you're willing to just roll up into a Marvel movie and you're only getting buying the ticket for that third act of fire for, fireworks that you're, you're going to get, then you won't be disappointed as far as, you know, you have 42 and a half, I guess... Uh, Iron Man suits flying around um, fighting bad guys. Um, the spectacle is there. Marvel movies will always have that spectacle. Um, I don't think they'll ever uh, lose out on that. But don't, like, if you're, if you can't just turn your brain off for a movie and just watch Pretty Lights, if you're not able to do that, don't see the movie. You will just be disappointed. Uh, final rating for the movie, I will say... I want to give it a 5 out of 10, but I feel like that's a little bit too harsh. Just a little bit. Just a smidgen. I'm going to give it a 6 out of... It's going to give it a 6 out of 10. I would give it a 5.5 out of 10, but I don't believe in giving half ratings, except for very special circumstances. And I'll see what would really make this movie a special case enough to give it a half rating. So I'm going to go with a 6 out of 10. I'm rounding up a bit. Um, it's a good movie. It just has it's just riddled from beginning to end with continuity errors most of which like i've said multiple times are because it exists in the universe of multiple movies um so that is the review um uh have a great day i guess bye